Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending upon where you are. I'm Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt, the rabbi of Congregation B'nai Tzedek in Potomac, Maryland, and the founding chairman of an organization, a new coalition of rabbis referred called the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition. It's my pleasure to be a host this today and uh, as a board member of the Hidden Light Institute. Just to take a moment, since some of you may not know and be familiar with the Hidden Light Institute, it is a relatively new organization founded to educate individuals about Jewish leaders, historical events, primarily through various documentary films and programs. Today's program, in fact, is the first, the inaugural one in a series of monthly programs. Our next webinar will be on January 13, 2021, when I will have an in-depth conversation with Natan Sharansky about his extraordinary career as a Jewish leader, as a Jewish hero, and as and the impact he's had on historical events in our time. So I want to take this opportunity also just to mention and to let you know that the Begin Symposium that the, on May 12th will be culminating these series of webinars with a symposium, Bezrat Hashem, in person in Yerushalayim with an international convocation that's going to focus on the leadership of Menachem Begin. At that time, the premiere of the documentary Upheaval about his life will be held at the Begin Center on May 13th. And so there's going to be a special mission going in connection with this, which will be taking place a, a week to 10 days before. We'd like to invite you to please come and be a part of the symposium, the premiere of the film, as well as a part of our mission. This kickoff webinar is the beginning of an examination of Menachem Begin's values and his leadership. So before I introduce our speakers today, we're going to recognize the partnership with the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem, and also the support, acknowledge the support of all of our partners and contributors to making this event possible. I'd like to turn things over in just a moment to Herzl Mikov, who is the executive director of the Menachem Begin Center. In fact, under his leadership, the center has grown to become one of the leaders in Zionist and democratic education, inspired by Menachem Begin's values and holding a hosting a series of programs for young people and soldiers and visitors every year. Mr. Mokov had previously served as chief of staff to Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir, as well as having served in the Israel Defense Forces as um, and was part of Operation Opera, which targeted the Osirik nuclear reactor in, in Iraq during Menachem Begin's time as Prime Minister. Herzi, it's a pleasure to see you again and to welcome you uh, to our forum and uh, thank you for all you've done in behalf of this particular important uh, uh, program that we have. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Ivan Bright, for your uh, warm words. Whenever I hear such an introduction, I uh, have to uh, remind our, myself what Henry Kissinger said when he was introduced uh, in such manner so he said that he's very sorry that his uh, parents are not uh, present in that event because uh, his father would get a lot of nachas and his mother would even believe what, uh, uh, the, int what the introduction uh, said. Uh, but Stuart, I want to thank you not only for hosting this uh, or moderating this uh, event, but for your dedication uh, to the cause of the project and among all the other important and uh, secret uh, causes that you are serve so uh, well and with such dedication and with such uh, talent. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's a privilege and uh, an honor to uh, Welcome you all, ladies, gentlemen, Gvirotai, Rabotai. Uh, good morning to uh, those of you who are in uh, the United States. Good evening to those who are here in Israel. And shalom to everybody that in between. Um, I would like also to welcome our two uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, Malcolm Honline and Minister Dan Meridor. Uh, two uh, leaders uh, in the service of the Jewish people. Both of them uh, accomplished a lot toward uh, the cause and the 
targets of the Jewish people. And both of them uh, were very intimate with uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin. So I believe that we don't have a better way to start this uh, uh, webinar series uh, than uh, hosting both Malcolm and uh, Dan. For us, uh, Menachem Begin, uh, his uh, values, his model of leadership is uh, something that we believe should inspire our current generation and generation to come um, in Israel and in the Jewish uh, people at large. And that's why we uh, believe that the symposium and the series of webinars that are leading to that symposium uh, is a, an essential part of uh, our job because we lack so much what Menachem Begin stood for. Uh, the love of the human being, the love of Israel and the commitment to those uh, two uh, uh, causes. Um, and I hope that we will be able with the help of the Hidden Light Institute and all other uh, others, friends that are committed uh, to the project to be able to do that. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, Hertzi, for that welcome. I'm gonna keep the introductions short because we have such distinguished individuals with us today and uh, really it's more important to hear from them than anyone else. Paul Gross is going to be uh, interviewing um, uh, both Malcolm and Dan. Paul is a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center where he's responsible for developing educational programming and public events in English. He lectures to a wide variety of groups um, and uh, in fact, before emigrating, immigrating to Israel in 2007, had worked at the Embassy of Israel in the uh, United Kingdom in the Public Affairs Department and as the ambassador's speechwriter. Um, he'll be speaking today and uh, interviewing Dan Meridor. Dan, who is familiar to many of us, has uh, uh, served as cabinet secretary under Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir. In addition to that, in 1984, he was elected to the Knesset in 1988, served as Minister of Justice and member of the Inner Cabinet, later went on to serve also as Minister of Finance, as well as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intelligence and Atomic Energy. After a very distinguished career in politics in 2013, he retired from politics and since then has held numerous voluntary and honorary positions, including as Chairman of the Jerusalem Foundation, Deputy Chairman of the Institute for National Security Studies, and is currently President of the Israel Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome, Dan. We also want to welcome Malcolm Honline. Malcolm has served as the executive director and as the CEO and executive vice chairman of the conference presidents of the major American Jewish organizations, which is, for those of you who don't know, the central coordinating body on international and national concerns for 50 national Jewish organizations. In that capacity, he has really made the conference of presidents the go-to organization, whether it's for our governments here in the United, government of the United States or foreign leaders as well. Malcolm is the person that they turn to as he has served as a senior, as an advisor to numerous national political officials, frequently consulted on public policy issues, appears regularly in the media on behalf as a spokesman of the American Jewish community. Um, this is after having served as the founding executive director of the JCRC of New York and earlier the founding executive director of the Greater New York Conference on Soviet Jewry. Again, Malcolm, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here today as well. Very distinguished career. These are two gentlemen who I have admired and uh, uh, truly enjoyed um, the opportunity to work together with them. And I'm looking forward to their uh, uh, comments today. Paul, back to you, please. Thank you very much, Rabbi Weinblatt. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege to be here in the company of uh, such distinguished um, guests. Um, when we were putting this together and we wanted to begin this series, um, really talking about Menachem Begin um, in detail, um, we wanted to focus both on his role as uh, one of the great Israeli leaders, prime ministers um, and public figures, and also as uh, a Jewish leader and as uh, someone who uh, epitomized uh, perhaps more than any other uh, Israeli uh, political figure, 
the the bond that connects Israel with uh, with world Jewry, with the diaspora. Um, and I don't think we could have two uh, better speakers, better guests to look at those two different aspects, the diaspora and um, and Menachem Begis' contribution to Israel, uh, than Malcolm Honline and Dan Murray Dorr. Um, so I'm going to, um, how this is going to work is I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions of each of, of, each of our guests um, and also give them the opportunity um, to uh, respond to each other's remarks if they wish, um, and then take some questions from you, our audience. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen uh, a Q&A button, um, which you can uh, access and ask a question there for either of our guests or for both of them. Uh, and I will um, read out uh, questions at the at the end of the uh, at the end of our time uh, here uh, today. Okay, um, I'm going to start with uh, with Malcolm Honline. Um, Malcolm, th th thanks again so much for joining us um, on this uh, on this uh, wonderful occasion, this first webinar. And uh, I know that you you're a great admirer of Malcolm Begins, and you you also um, uh, knew him. Um, can you uh, can you talk to us about both the significance of Menachem Begin's prime ministership for diaspora Jews and how you see Menachem Begin as a as a real example of Jewish leadership? Thank you, uh, thank you, Rabbi Herzl, Paul, uh, Tamar, uh, Rob, and Simon, and all of those who helped put this together. It's a real privilege to participate and especially to be with my friend Dan Meridor, a friend of many years standing and somebody I respect greatly. Uh, I have to say that from the outset that I'm not an objective observer when it comes to Menachem Begin. I knew him, I worked with him, I had the privilege of being with him on so, so many occasions and bonded with him and established a special relationship that lasted until his last days. There's so much to say in answer to your two questions, but I'll try to focus on a few points. Menachem Begin left an indelible impact on Israel, Jewish history, and Jews everywhere. He had a fundamental commitment to Jewish unity and saw the whole Jewish people as his responsibility. He was concerned about their safety and security and sought to reach out and reunite with isolated and persecuted Jewish communities and to bring them back to their people and their state. It was a personal and ideological commitment. He lived, call Yisrael Arabian Zebo said that every Jew is responsible for one another. It was evidenced in his championing the cause of Soviet Jewry from its early days, including convening the Third World Conference on Soviet Jewry in Jerusalem, and his refusal to renew diplomatic relations with the USSR unless the prisoners of Zion were released. The struggle for Soviet Jewry was deeply rooted in Begin's belief system and priorities and his personal history. The same was true with the rescue of Ethiopian Jews to which he committed resources and determination. He never shied away from inviting American and European and other Jews to come home to Israel. The searing experiences and memories of the Holocaust, the fight for the struggle and struggle for Israel's independence and the lessons of his mentor and Moraderech, Zeb Jabotinsky guided him throughout his life. He could not abide Jews fighting Jews, even at times a great personal cost. He demonstrated remarkable restraint when he felt the larger causes of the Jewish people called for it. No one need recount that what happened at the Altalena and to see when General Dayan was selected as his defense minister, although he came from an opposing party and that he kept diplomats in place from the, all of the labor years, even though they often worked to undermine his agenda. He showed respect for those who did not reciprocate. And one of those was, of course, David Ben-Gurion, who always referred to him, I'm told, as Oso Haish, that man. But he treated him with great respect. Begin was a man of really immeasurable humility. I, I saw him in an airplane flying to Israel, and he bent down to tie his wife, his late wife, Belisa's shoes, as, uh, because she couldn't do it herself. He tolerated many insults from media, political leaders, pundits, personalities at home and abroad. Remember when Time Magazine said Begin rhymes with Fagan? We recall uh, the threats of major donors in the United States and Europe of uh, warning, as did public officials and elected officials, of the consequences of Begin becoming prime minister. 
as a young professional, I remember sitting in very heated discussions and with the open disdain for the man, the disregard for all he had done, who he was and his sacrifices. I know that when he came to New York to speak, he would often sit alone in his hotel room and I would go and visit him. For me, it was a great benefit and privilege because I spent many hours listening to him and being able to benefit from his history and story. But once he became prime minister, the lines went all the way down the corridors of these same hotels. There was an event I organized at which the chairman refused to allow Begin to speak, I think when Arafat came to the UN. And it was only after I threatened to pull out that they conceded to let him speak towards the end of the program. And he was introduced simply, ladies and gentlemen, Menachem Bagan. And he turned that crowd of hundreds of thousands into a cheering and roaring uh, crowd that rustled through the canyons of New York in an unbelievable way. But as much as he could tolerate on a personal level, when it came to the dignity of the Jewish people and the Jewish state, when either was being assaulted, that he would not tolerate. He had famous exchanges with top US officials, some of which have been published recently, with leaders of Congress and foreign leaders who dared to impugn the integrity, the destiny, and the rights of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We are not a banana republic, he declared. Our ancestors were princes when yours were. He would rise in indignation, but dignity to defend the Jewish state's honor, the sanctity of the independent Jewish state. He talked of the abandonment of the Jewish people in the Shoah by the very same people who called on him to put Israel's security at risk. So many had sacrificed so much. And he said, no more. No more was Jewish blood to be cheap and disregarded. He told one distinguished U.S. ambassador to Israel, U.S. affirmation of Israel's right to exist is not a favor, nor is it negotiable. It is not a concession. I shall not negotiate my existence with anybody, and I need no one's affirmation of it. Many in America spoke of boycotting the newly elected Begin. His politics were too right, his speeches and appearance too Jewish. They feared embarrassment by this truly noble gentleman. They were embarrassed and afraid because he reminded them what a good and proud Jew was and what they stood for. In fact, they did not need to be afraid and could come out from under the tables as he got to earn from many their admiration, even if begrudgingly, and later granting him hero status with Sadat's visit to Jerusalem. Perhaps true personal qualities were best personified in the unique relationship he established with the chairman of the Conference of Presidents at that time, Rabbi Alex Schindler, who headed the reform movement. I should say they established, because the liberal head of the US reform movement, many of whose members were severely critical, if not apoplectic at Begin's election, reached out to the prime minister as the prime minister reciprocated. But the two men saw their larger responsibility and opened up to each other as a partner, a trusted, even beloved ally in arms for the Jewish state. It set a unique standard, hardly matched of true Jewish leadership that had a critical impact in New York, on American Jewry, in Jerusalem, on Israeli Jews, and most importantly, in Washington. As a Kalal Yisrael Jew, with his broad vision, Begin did not focus on differences, but all the things that we have in common. He could see, through those who put up pretenses just as he responded to sincere approaches. He looked especially favorably on younger personalities as I and I think Dan can attest. Schindler's embrace had a broad impact here as Begin's did in Israel. It laid the foundation for his relationship with three more chairmen of the Conference of Presidents, but more importantly for diaspora Israel relations. Many productive results came about as a result, certainly strength those ties. Begin was a model of Jewish leadership in substance and symbolism. He was dedicated to the Jewish faith, the Jewish state, the Jewish people, Jewish history, and Jewish faith. He put on a yarmulke to quote Tanakh, whether at the White House or at the United Nations. He respected Yahadut and walked to shul when in New York for Shabbat or to Sadat's funeral held on a Saturday in Cairo. He quoted the story of Rav Amnon that we say in Natsan Tokef on Yom Kippur, when asked by a president of the United States to consider a concession on Jerusalem, he said, I cannot even let him think that I would consider it. Even if not fully observant personally, 
he was a traditional Jew who loved our heritage, our Messorah, and honored it in his role of representing all the Jewish people everywhere. A man of unbreakable principle, of unyielding love of his country and people, a formidable opponent, but a wonderful ally and devoted friend, a true leader of Israel for the generations. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. That is a wonderful tribute and a wonderful way for us to start this webinar and this series of webinars. Um, and um, I'm, I, I really appreciate you, uh, you sharing that with us. Um, Dan Murray Dorr. Uh, Dan, you were um, Menachem Begin's chief of staff at the beginning of your uh, career in, in public life um, before a very long career in, in Israeli politics uh, as a member of Knesset and a minister in, in a number of different governments. Um, and you also, I think, one of the uh, one of those Israeli uh, politicians most associated with um, the principles of Menachem Begin um, and the and of uh, uh, Zev Jabotinsky, uh, his uh, his teacher and mentor that, that Malcolm also mentioned in his in his address. Um, Dan, can you tell us uh, from looking at it now from the Israeli perspective, um, what can you say um, to the audience here about um, how how Menachem Begin was a leader, not just not just another leader of Israel, but a leader with principles and values um, who managed to contribute such a huge amount to Israeli peace and security as well. Well, good uh, day to all of you, Malcolm. Thank you for the great words you said. You reminded me of who you are before the coronavirus when I met more of you. And it's good to hear you now. Hopefully we'll see you in three dimensions, not just two, when this, uh, when this plague is over. Well, Menachem Begin, you know, I had the opportunity to meet and work with many people, prime ministers, ministers, some very impressive ones, some less so. I haven't met anybody in the same magnitude as Menachem Begin had. You know, when asked uh, sometime, some years before he died, how do you want to be remembered? He said, I want to be remembered as the man who prevented civil war. Malcolm mentioned it. You know what leadership is, unlike what you see today in both our countries, leadership is not going to the pollster and asking them what do the people want and then do it, do it. For this, you don't need a leader, you need the pollster. Leadership is sticking to your values, ideas, and convincing the people you are right even staying in minority, even doing things that people don't like. You are sure, you are right. You try to get your way through and lead in that direction. In the underground, he was the man who, who declared the revolt against the British uh, mandate over Palestine. Not easy at all. Persecuted by his uh, compatriots, Israelis. And when they were persecuted, sometimes handed over to the British and sometimes uh, hit and tortured, he said, don't raise your hand in return. I heard from him and he wrote about it, how many of his friends and colleagues in the Irgun, in the underground said, we cannot continue like that, let us respond. Don't do that. Altalena, the ship that was brought and was shot at by Ben Gurion's order and, and he said, don't shoot back. You think of many other underground movement who had civil war he prevented it more than anybody else. So the courage of being the commander of the underground of the Irgun Svei Lumi was, I think, the height of his career, if you ask him. Then as prime minister, uh, as I said, leadership is not doing what you think the people may want to do, but what you think is right. Had Menachem Begin asked the Likudniks and the other people of Israel before 77, should I give up every inch of Sinai and in fact give up the, the application unilaterally of sovereignty of Judea and Samaria for peace with Egypt? I'm sure he would have gotten a negative response. He was sure he was right and fought his way within the Likud. Some of them voted against him in the Knesset and he did the most fantastic job. He carried out this revolution in Israeli security and, uh, and strength in the Middle East by really uh, having Egypt 
as a peace uh, neighbor and changing the strategic posture altogether. No more Arab unity of hatred against us, opening the way to what we have seen today, more and more Arab countries coming to terms with us. He did it because he believed in it, was ready to go all the way and even uh, had political arguments with his best friends. This is leadership. This is not uh, catering to the lower taste, how you get elected today in many countries, but doing it your way. He had to go to election nine times in opposition, and didn't change his ideas. And this is leadership that we saw with Menachem Begin. And this leadership, uh, uh, one should say, comes with this modesty and, and the honesty that you heard. You know, when Menachem Begin retired in 1983, I was the secretary of cabinet. He decided to retire. We may come to that later. And the question was, where would he go to live now? He had no apartment. He used to live as a tenant in a key money apartment. It was given back to the landlord and where he would go was unclear. So I looked for uh, apartments. We found one in Jerusalem. And Menachem Begin paid $600 per month. It was a lot of money from his salary for, for his lodging where he lives. Think of other prime ministers or presidents having served as he did decades in the in the cause of the Jewish people ended up with nothing material in his hands, never cared about money, but material things. He had the, the belief, the values, the vision. This was all that interested him. Uh, and uh, he uh, was able to put together and balance two major values as uh, taught by Zev Jabotinsky, his mentor, no doubt. It was very national. The national Jewish cause was his cause, as it's our cause. After the Holocaust, before the Holocaust, the revival of the Jewish people, the regathering into, into Zion was all his life. But if you go nationalist and you forget the democratic liberal side, you may end up in very bad corner. So he was the most liberal of all Israeli prime ministers in defending democracy, defending the Supreme Court, defending human rights, even to his opponents, not only to his friends. So this balancing the two flags of national and liberal. In fact, he called the Likud party that he formed in his official name, a national liberal movement, not only national, not only liberal. This has to do with the concept of justice. You know, when Begin decided to do something, the first question he would ask himself was not whether it's good for us or not. Of course, he wouldn't do things that are not good for us. The question is, is it just? Is it the just thing to do? I am that Sodek. He looked for tzedek, for justice. It was very important for him to do what is right. And uh, this is a, a unique feature I didn't see in many people. And his uh, leader of uh, the Israelis elected by them, and as Malcolm said, of many Jews all over the world, was very much in him. He saw the history of Jewish people on his shoulders. He really thought in historic dimensions. He was there in the 30s in Europe. He saw how Poland was uh, torn to two by the Russians and the communists and then the Germans. And he had to fly from Warsaw to Vilna and then he was arrested by the Soviets and, and spent time uh, in, in their camp in Siberia. Uh, he saw this. He lost only not only his family, parents, his brother. He saw the Jewish, the center of Jewish people which was Europe or Eastern Europe. And he saw the failure. We don't see it this way. We love to, to boast rightly of the great success of Zionism, but it's saw the failure. We didn't succeed to save European Jewry. Zionism was meant to save them. In the 19th century, the end of it, many people felt the Europe is not there for the Jews anymore. Many fled to America. The, the Zionists said, we'll have a state, they will go there. We didn't have it in time. 10 years earlier, had we had a state, there wouldn't be a Holocaust. So he saw the Holocaust and the historical and, and human dimensions of it and swore never again and swore to build a strong Israel, strong militarily, strong economically, strong morally. Uh, there's no other Israeli prime minister who is known for this moral approach to life and the decency and, and, and the honesty as Menachem Begin did. There were many opponents to him, Ben-Gur and others mentioned, but nobody ever 
said Begin is lying, or Begin is not keeping his word, or Begin is acting in a corrupt way, no one. He was known to be a model. And you know, in leadership, there is above and over the political vision and the political action, there is a, a, the mention of a moral compass. People look to you and you want them to, uh, I want the people to look at the prime minister, say, yeah, this is how I need to behave. He was such a model because of his decency, his commitment and his really absence of any ego as much as one can be without an ego in politics. It's the Jewish cause, not my cause. Uh, this was Begin. If you think of Israeli democracy, even as the opposition leader, the, the sticking to democratic values, telling his people only by voting, this is how we change the government, not anything else, only by convincing. This was Begin. The uh, embrace he gave to, the, uh, to the, those parts of the Israeli society who were left outside, who were not part of the leading uh, uh, echelon be it the Mizrahim, those who came from North Africa mainly, be it the Datiim, the religious party. He really saw uh, the ideal of Klal Israel, of, of seeing all of us together as one, as a major element in his, his uh, Weltanschauung, the, the worldview of his. And uh, the rhetoric that might have looked to some as a you know, traditional, a bit old coming with a very rich Hebrew from the, the education in Eastern Europe was so unique of him and typical of him and people listened. I remember him standing in Jerusalem uh, in many uh, election campaigns, quoting in Latin that he loved. I think 99% didn't understand the word, but they would all <laughs> look like this and applaud and follow. Uh, he spoke about uh, issues that many people didn't really know where from he had it. He was a literary man, he knew literature. When he was alone at his home about nine years after he retired in 83, all the way to the, his, his demise and, and at death in, in 92, I used to visit him every week on Friday, an hour with Begin three or four to report to him what we were doing and discuss things. I, and I saw the man, he was reading books, literary books, talking with me about uh, not in diaspora before the Second World War, about the literature, Russian, German. He was so uh, knowledgeable and, and had such a wide, uh, wide uh, erudition, wide uh, knowledge and, and, the, and the acquaintance with European culture and with Jewish culture. As Malcolm said, he was not religious. He was not uh, abiding by all the Tariag mitzvot. He, I can tell you, nobody listened that uh, there was light on Shabbat in his home. And it was not, it was not a, something religious do we like to call as, uh, as obedience. No, it's not. But the Jewish cause was his cause. The respect to the Jewish tradition, including the Chagim, including the behavior, the respect to Rabbanim, there were Rabbanim rabbis who did not behave properly. I don't want to mention names, who acted not in a respectable way. He would always uh, approach them in a respectable way because they were the, the rabbis of the community. I, I remember this in America, I remember it in Israel. And it was important for him to, to in a way, in building the new Jew out of diaspora after the, 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 the destruction of European Jewry, to build a new Jew that has dignity the dignity of the Jewish people and the dignity of human, human dignity and liberty. You, you know, we had passed the law, I had something to do with that, of human dignity and liberty. In 92 was a, people called it constitutional revolution. Begin cared about national dignity and liberty and individual liberty and unity. He called his party Cheut, which means liberty. Liberty for the nation, liberty for the person. He, he added his attitude to the Arab minority was exactly this. Most of them didn't vote for him, but he insisted that they have their rights and equal rights. And he opposed the military government that was imposed on them. Here was a man of principle, whether it was politically beneficial or not, was not important. These are the principles. Here we fight and a man of courage to make decisions that are unpopular. So looking at Menachem Begin as the leader, I had a 
privilege, honor to work with and know quite well day in, day out uh, was something I will never forget, of course. But I'm very happy that the Begin Heritage Center is doing that great job in not only telling the stories, but trying to teach the lessons that we should learn from this great uh, personality in our history. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I think if anyone um, listening to this had any questions or doubts beforehand as to as to why there was a need to uh, to educate the Jewish world um, about Menachem Begin, I think the, the, the what both of you gentlemen have said will have dispelled those doubts because it's clear from what you said just how unique he was, both as a uh, as you said, Dan as an Israeli prime minister and leader um, who was absolutely committed to liberal democracy and absolutely committed um, to the Jewish people and the security of the Jewish state. Um, and Malcolm, the way you described um, just how special and different he was um, as a, not just as an Israeli leader, but as a Jewish leader and as someone who could connect um, to Jewish people um, around the world and wherever they lived. And that he was someone who, um, as I think famously described himself as a as a as a Jew first uh, before before an Israeli, um, uh, that was his primary um, identity. Um, I wonder if uh, if either one of you would like to respond to comments that the other said. Then I welcome welcome you to do so. I fully endorse everything that Dan said. And he was there on the front line even more than I. So you've heard two complementary perspectives uh, of seeing the guy in, in many different circumstances, including very tense ones. So we'll, uh, let's hear the no, question. Having Thank listened you. to Malcolm, I can say with the judge's right, I concur and I have nothing to add. <laughs> yeah, Pat. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's let's turn to some questions that we've that we've been uh, given um, by our audience here. Um, I mean, th there were a few questions that are about sort of contemporary Israel, um, and obviously, Dan, uh, your your base here in Israel, and I'll I'll go to you with these. But I'm definitely interested in Malcolm's views, and also if Malcolm can can also relate them perhaps to. The way in which um, uh, contemporary Israeli leaders could learn, perhaps from Begin, in the way that they relate to diaspora Jews. Um, there were questions about the way in which Begin would view Israel today in terms of social progress, economic progress. Dan, can you comment on those? Well, I, I uh, quite hesitant to give you a Begin response to. Uh, reality of today when Begin passed away in 92, almost 30 years ago, it was presumptuous, I don't want to do that, but I can, I can guess uh, that some things are quite clear. I, I'm sure he would have been proud and happy to see what was, what came of Israel after 70 something years of Israeli independence. We have over 7 million Jews living in Israel. Think of that. I, I, as a child, remember the first million, seven million Jews. It's, it's, a, it's an important country. It's not uh, something that can be uh, forgotten tomorrow. Uh, the idea that Israel's economic uh, condition is good, that we are, as you call it, a startup nation, that we are admired for that in the world, that we are strong in the Middle East, that more Arab countries come to peace with us. I'm sure you would have seen that with great respect. Um, I, I try not to go into politics, although it's very tempting now, but I would say that the, the, what he would definitely uh, not agree with is what we see today in the, uh, the uh, attacks day and night on the legal system, on the Supreme Court, on basic democratic values of human rights. You know, if you utter in Israel the words human rights, democracy, rule of law, you are depicted as a leftist today. But these are the terms that Begin spoke of fighting for. It was a consensus. So there was a shift here. I tend to believe he would not have agreed with that shift. He tried, as I said, to combine the very strong national interest 
with justice, with democracy. This is something that has been a bit marred in Israel. The, the uh, hate talk against the other. We are in politics and uh, people do talk like this and they have always talked like this, but the, uh, the extreme language that is used today and the use of hate and the, the defining yourself, but what you are not, you're not the other, but the other is that or this, I want to go into that. This is something that is entirely against the begging idea of respecting the other, even if you don't agree with him all the way. So I, I think that uh, what I say is what I think. So I believe maybe you would have thought it, but I again say, I can't tell you what he would have done today. I think that the basic values of his are known to me. I know them, they are well-documented, he fought for them. Some of them we have, we have uh, reached with great success, high level of, of, of uh, performance. In others, we have to correct our ways very much so. If I can, I, I think there's one issue where we could uh, speculate. I actually was with him at one time when there was very heated fighting over Yamit, about the withdrawal from Yamit, which was so painful for him. And you know, when you see that somebody who has the strong beliefs and a consistent set pattern of commitments, the greater is or what he believed Israel should be, that if he gave something, it was like giving a limb, uh, but, but if it was served the greater purpose that Dan described to, to have lived at that time and to have seen how he addressed it and, and the toll it took on him. And you saw that in, in uh, his resignation we should talk about. But I think that if we look today and celebrate the Abraham Accords, we have to see the root in his efforts with Sadat. It was not because the United States brought them together. If I remember, it was against the United States because both were concerned about steps that America had taken. Of course, they played a critical role later at Camp David, but the courage to, to meet with Sadat, whose history, you know, Begin knew well, and to see the potential in that at that time which we're reaping the benefits. If there hadn't been peace with Egypt, there wouldn't have been peace with Jordan and it wouldn't have been the Abraham Accords today. They would not have broken that, the solid wall of Arab rejectionism had it not been for that. So one can see that Begin's foresight and commitment and willingness to give up the Sinai, three times Israel's sides, the oil fields, the air force bases. I mean, people today don't know. And I ask young people, they have no clue that Israel gave back the Sinai and, and what, the decisions that Begin had to make at the time to, to enable that all to happen. And yet they ridiculed and they mocked him and he didn't care because as Dan said, he saw it as, as the just thing to do for Israel's long-term interest and security. So I think his impact in many more ways than just that, I think he would have been delighted with Israel as a high-tech nation. Um, he, he didn't talk about nanotechnology like other prime ministers did, but he he had a vision for Israel, uh, you know, the idea of Israel as a Switzerland, that all the brain power, what it could do to transform the region. So he, uh, I, I do think that we can see his, his fingerprints in a lot of the things today. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here, which um, perhaps both of you uh, can give a perspective on one from Israel and one from the United States. Um, uh, Ken Stein, uh, Professor Ken Stein is asking about um, he's looking for um, uh, views on uh, how Begin saw the two presidents with whom he interacted when he was prime minister, uh, Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan. Um, can either one of you or both of you provide uh, a, a story or a vignette that, that characterizes how Begin understood, uh, and I'm quoting verbatim here, the qualities slash shortcomings of Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan? Well, I, uh, I your begging uh, was polite. And maybe uh, not many people, including myself, might have heard every uh, nuance of what he thought about the people he met with, including President Carter and President Reagan. Uh, he spoke highly of President Carter after Kim David and making of him a big hero. I am afraid along the years, uh, I, I could sense that he uh, had some reservations but the Carter was uh, that sort of a Jabotinsky-like man, which he said one time, I think 
this was something that uh, uh, I think he understood Carter in the end. He, uh, if you read the books that were written about Kim David, uh, including by Bill Quant, who was there, how Begin with his own style was able to get his way through at Kim David. So he knew Carter, he knew how to work with Carter. And uh, in the end, Carter did do a great thing in the end. We had peace, including according to all historians, the Carter contribution. Other things Carter did were not very uh, good for us, I think. Reagan, Reagan definitely was a friendly uh, president to Israel. But I remember on August, I think 30 or 31st, 1982, we are deep in the Lebanon war. Reagan has, I wouldn't say given us a green light, but did not object to what we did. He and General Hager was then the Secretary of State. But then after we got to a certain point in the war in Lebanon, uh, Begin is in Naharia at a vacation and there comes, I think to me, uh, a phone call from Sam Lewis, the Am American ambassador, that he has a, a letter from the president to the prime minister. And he and Sam f um, uh, goes to Naharia and gives the letter. This was the Reagan plan. I wasn't there, I was in Jerusalem. Begin read it and decided to go to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, he phones me and says, Dan, come to the office, you have to write a response. There was something in Begin that is really unique, personally. He had such a great memory, and he had texts of pages and pages in his head, and he would, it would come down. I wrote, I didn't write, he told me what to write, not me. But everything was in place, from the dot to the comma, everything all the way. Why we say no, politely, to the Reagan plan. And uh, there was a sort of confrontation. He did not hesitate. I, and he said, no, there's, there are things that we won't do. And, the, uh, and the, this uh, standoff was there. But uh, I remember him writing to President Reagan. I used to then translate the letters to the cabinet meeting on Sunday before the war in Lebanon uh, to tell them we cannot tolerate it. We'll have to respond if they don't stop. There was an exchange with, with President Reagan, uh, then with the Secretary Haig with Prime Minister Thatcher. And I used to write, I mean, I was the secretary, I was not the inventing, and he had everything in his head. And uh, I, I, the, the way he dealt with world leaders, including Reagan, was very respectful, but uh, the Israeli or Jewish cause was very clear there. And they respected him for this. Although sometimes there was no agreement, they respected his is standing on the on the principles and on the interests of Israel. Uh, I remember uh, something that uh, uh, I remember as a what should I say it astonished me. Begin went to see Reagan. Uh, I I was not in that mission. Coming back, I asked uh, Yudha Avner, who was his uh, assistant to diaspora to the English language, to give me the protocol of the meeting. So uh, Yuda says to me, no, you don't have to give me the, like, I don't have the protocol, but the Americans gave me what the president is going to say. I said, what do you mean by that? When the president said that and read from papers, it was a, a six eyes or eight eyes meeting and he was reading. And I remember talking to Begin, Begin saw it, he was smiling, I'm, I mean, president cannot talk, but needs to read from papers or from cards. I saw the same thing when I met Reagan, which I mean, Shamir read Reagan, I joined Shamir. And we sat in a small meeting, three or four of us, and the president was very sympathetic, very nice person, read from cards. It was a leadership, a kind of leadership we didn't know. Begin never allowed anybody to write speeches for him. When he came to office in 77, I heard this, I wasn't there. He, Yuda Avner came to him and asked him uh, how to write speeches to him. He said, Yuda, nobody writes speeches for me. I, I do it myself. So it was a different style of a leader than the one you see today. But I think he saw in Reagan a, a friend of Israel, which I think he was. Uh, he had a very good uh, relationship with other Americans that were around him in the Congress and of course in the administration, even General Haig, I remember that uh, very much, and Secretary Schultz. When he came in to replace uh, Haig in 82, I remember the first meeting. We sit in the office and we are speaking, he's speaking and Schultz sit down as the Secretary of State with a copy book and a pen and writes what we say. And then Begin and I spoke, he said, he is objective, he listens, he's a scholar. Didn't come with the preconceived solutions, he came to learn. 
And I remember our generals, Ehud Barak and others were speaking, giving, and the students were sitting like a pupil in the university writing. Like, it impressed me a lot. And Begin, the man is serious. He, he comes to learn. And they had good relationship, both of them, Begin and Schultz. And by the way, Schultz and Shamir as well afterwards. So yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I know what he thought of other leaders, not always very positive. He was very polite and would not say things openly. He would oppose and did oppose the Germans, the German Chancellor Schmidt, who uh, offered him to do things that he thought were dangerous. He gave him a speech that uh, I think Schmidt remembered for many years, and not forgetting he was German and even officer in the Wehrmacht. So Begin knew how to speak. And it was the, his polemics were most uh, humorous and, and sarcastic, and he knew how to do that. But I think he had good relationship in spite or because of his position with the American president, be it Carter or Reagan. Yeah, I think leaders can learn a lot from Begin style and it'll have to wait till I write my book to tell the, some of the stories that I remember from the two. I, I was you know, relatively new. I, I just, um, it was a transitional period for me too. Um, but I sat with Begin on several occasions and one where he asked me about Bitburg when Reagan made the decision to visit the um, cemetery yeah, with the SS. And for that, for Begin was just inexplicable how you could go and pay tribute. And we know who was responsible now, but I have not told this, but I, I did, we were doing an event for Jewish Heritage Week and I had invited Elie Wiesel to join me at the White House to launch the first one and Reagan was doing it. And that's where he made the speech, Mr. President, that is not your place, if you all recall that classic address by uh, Elie Wiesel. But then the president took me into his private office, into the uh, Oval Office. And he said, I've never told anybody, but you know, I committed a crime. I stole a film when I left the army, I think in 1945, of the concentration camps. And he said, I took it because I wanted at least that my children will be able to give testimony when in the coming years, people will deny that this happened. Now think of this, the war was just ending and he had that vision. And I told this to the prime minister to put in context what Bitburg, which I think he was, he was finagled into, he didn't really understand and realize it. And it's true, he used cards and uh, he would not let me leave a meeting until I told him the latest Jews from Soviet Jewry. He collected jokes about the Soviet Union, which so you know he held in very special regard. And uh, he would tell me one and I would tell him one. One time I ran out of jokes and I didn't know what to do because he stayed and I stayed and we were alone there. And finally a hand reached out from the Oval Office and pulled him in. But his feelings about Soviet Jewry and Reagan was very real. And uh, he appreciated what they do and the, and the sacrifice and was uh, always supportive. We tend to idealize his, his presidency. Remember, it was the AWAC sale that kicked off his presidency. There were many issues, contentious issues, even during that time. But his personal feelings and his history were clear. And, and I, he, did, he accepted Begin as Begin. He accepted, you know, he loved, he cared about Israel. He spoke about it very warmly to me and, and to, to and many others. Carter did not have the history. And I established a relationship that was very strange during the campaign. And then afterwards, he used to call me at home, talk to me at times about these subjects, which was, you know, very strange experience. But he didn't have the personal identification commitments. He was very religious. There might have been a religious overtone. But later, I think that turned against uh, Israel and his association, uh, his relationship and attitudes uh, towards Israel. But Begin took each person as they were. And I know at Camp David, people told me stories and then you would know firsthand that even when it got very contentious, Begin tried to contain himself and to deal with it. When he threatened to leave, when he threatened to other things, it was only because he saw that the interests of Israel were put in jeopardy or put in danger. It was never a personal animosity, regardless of what he may have felt in his heart. And I think that that it was the hallmark throughout his, his prime ministership. And today people make everything personal. Today it's, it becomes on, amongst world leaders and the longer vision, it, it, people are hungry for a, a long vision in every country, in every democracy and non-democracy today. And, and that is what Begin brought to everything that he did. Thank you very much. 
Um, before we, uh, there's a lot of questions and I'm afraid we're not gonna get through them all. Um, but before I hand back to uh, Rabbi Weinblatt, I'm gonna ask each of you one question um, from among the many that we've received. Um, Malcolm, perhaps you can answer this one. Um, it's about, and you touched on it in your initial address, but can you say something about how you perceived Begin's relationship with, with Yiddishkeit, with, with, with Yadut, with Judaism itself? It, it was pervasive. Begin was a Jew through and through. It's not so much, you know, whether he ate got kosher all the time or whatever, but in any public appearance, he presented himself consistent with Jew, with halakha, with Jewish principles, with Jewish values, Jewish tradition. He was a man of Jewish heritage. He, he bore all those things with pride. When he put on a yarmulke, it was a sign of respect, not of obligation. It was the way when he quoted Tanakh to be able to answer in a Jewish context, to, quoting uh, sources, religious or Bible, Tanakh, other things to make his point in, in key speeches which I know others have been reluctant to do. It's, you know, it was too Jewish. And that accusation, I think, was the greatest compliment to, to Begin, that he was too Jewish. He was Jewish through and through. And I think Dan made reference to it that you know, it's, it's not the halachic observance that made him uh, what he was. I think he was truly a religious person. It's wrong to say it wasn't religious. He was a religious person. He may not have been as observant, but he was religious in every respect. And I will tell you, there were prime ministers who used to ask me to help them get out of New York when I holiday or Yonta fell during the UN um, week. And they would say to me quietly, could you arrange you know, this or that for me to get out of the city? Begin would welcome the opportunity. And sometimes he would walk to more than one shul on a Shabbos morning to be there and to be physically present and to, to join. It was something that he felt he, he, not out of a, a religious obligation, he could have stayed in his hotel, but because of his identification with the Jewish people and with and with Yiddishkeit per se. Thank you very much, um, Dan. Uh, we have a question here about the you you mentioned um, that throughout his career he had to put up with a lot of um, slights, a lot of people uh, dismissing him or um, telling lies about him smearing him in all kinds of ways and he was always as both of you have said this gentleman uh with a great deal of humility um but as someone who knew him very well personally um was he ever was he the question is was he ever bitter about the way he was treated or mistreated by by people did you experience that let me add something first to what Malcolm said about the Jewishness of Begin. The Yadut, when Begin was elected, I mean, the Likud got the numbers, and Begin, uh, I think, was the first time uh, marching to the Prime Minister's office. He was interviewed by an interviewer of the Israel TV. There was one TV, then Yaakov Achimel. And Yaakov asked him, you can see it on YouTube, I think, how are you going to rule? And he said, in a good Jewish way, no other prime minister will say this. Jewish, what is, yeah. And not only that he was uh, saying it, he did it with pride. It's not something he would hide. I'm a Jew, all through a Jew. I'm proud to be a Jew. I have all the Jewish heritage on my shoulders and my responsibility. Jewish people, Jewish heritage, Jewish past, Jewish future. He thought Jewish, that is very important. And being a human person, man, for all people, Jews and non-Jews alike. This is, uh, of course, very important. About the way he was treated uh, Again, I give you one example of history. Ben-Gurion, the head of the other camp, the socialist camp, Mapai, labor, treated him very badly, ugly, and didn't use his name, and, and called him awful things, comparing him to the, the worst of our enemies. And uh, in 1967, before the Six Days War broke out, there was a huge crisis here. You may remember after the uh, uh, Egyptians uh, marched into Sinai, they kicked out the UN forces, the war was about to come and there was confusion. Eshkol, as Prime Minister, was a good one, but was not see, did not seem the leader for the war. And there was a lot of political uh, and, and 
uh, feeling that things don't well, Begin went to Ben Gurion, his uh, adversary, I wouldn't say enemy, and offered him and said, Ben Gurion should come back to leadership now before the Sixth Days War. We need him back. He went to Eshkol and said, Take Ben Gurion into the cabinet, Minister of Defense or something. Eshkol said, These two horses can't ride together. He didn't want. But see Begin asking in time of pressure, of danger, of risk. To call his opponent, adversary, the, the worst, to treat him very ugly. Uh, so this was him. I can't say that he always treated people like this. There were people who got hit back by him uh, verbally, and he knew how to do that. But not only having the other cheek like the, the Christian idea, no, he knew how to fight back. He never complained to me about him being treated uh, not fairly. This is, he was in the, in the game. This is the, these are the rules of the game. That's how they play. But he did complain about the way they treated Jabotinsky. He did complain about the, the discrimination against the Herut people, the people of the Irgun, people of Herut. A lot. I heard this. You know, he fought against what in Israel is called protexia, having connection where the labor uh, ruled them. You would have a, a settle, a small paper from somebody, give him a job, give him something. He's from our people. And Begin said, we will never do that. Nothing political. We, got, we will come to power. We'll not do political favors to our people. We'll treat everybody equal. And he fought even in government. I remember a letter that he got from an old revisionist here in Jerusalem, living 100 meters from here, somebody who comes from Dohobich, Poland. He said to me, Menachem, he said to him, writing to him, now we are back, we are in power at long last. Now you have to, to kick the, or to, to, to fire the labor people and have our people in. And I remember Begin writing back to him, I think I still have the paper. I will not fire anybody because of his political opinions and not appoint people because of the political opinions. We will not do what they have done. So he, he had the principles, when, even when people didn't like it. So he did not complain personally, but definitely he was attacked in a very unfair way. Not only bad for him, bad for us, Israel, because he could have done even more had he been earlier in power. But the um, depicting of the other, begging that case, as a danger, as a, as a half fascist, as a warmonger, it was uh, beneficial to his opponents. This is why when he came to power, there was a fear all over the world. This warmonger will get us to war. And he is the great peacemaker. It was never right that he would go to war. Yes, he knew how to stand on our interests and even to use force if one needs to do that. But it was always for peace, not for war. Strength was to get peace, not to get people killed. This they didn't understand because of the incitement against him. And he fought it his own way. Uh, he uh, knew in some cases from people outside it was anti-Semitism. When he was uh, elected, the London Times wrote, Begin rhymes, rhymes like Fagin, Fagin the thief from the British literature that you know might have learned as a child. So he knew there was anti-Semitism in it. I remember that very much. But he, uh, he responded in his own proud way, never complained, how do they treat me? I didn't hear him whining and weeping because of this, no. Okay, thank you very, very much, Dan Murray Dorr. Thank you very, very much, Malcolm Honlein. Uh, it's been a remarkable um, uh, 40 minutes or so of um, tribute and, and information and education about Menachem Begin. And I don't think anyone listening to this will be in any doubt um, just how um, special this man was and why, um, why we are um, putting on this, this webinar series, why we are putting on a symposium in May and why the Hidden Light Institute has produced a documentary film about this uh, extraordinary uh, leader. Um, I want to just say um, on behalf of the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, before I hand back to Rabbi Weinblatt, that uh, some people on this um, call, some people on this meeting, sorry, um, are actually regular, I think, regular attendees of um, uh, English programming that I run on a Wednesday um, at this time. Um, and if anyone wants to uh, know about the things that we do here, uh, it, for English speakers, please drop me an email. Um, I'm writing my email address into the chat box. Uh, my name is Paul Gross again, and the email is paulg at begincenter.org.il. So please do that, and I will let you know what we're doing, which also includes, of course, 
all the uh, subsequent webinars in this series. Um, but thank you again to Dan Murray Dorr, to Malcolm Honline, um, and I'm going to hand back now to Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt. Thank you, Paul, and uh, to, to Dan and Malcolm, uh, absolutely wonderful uh, uh, exposition today in which we uh, really have a chance to gain some uh, fascinating insights in not just to the uh, uh, life and career of Menachem Begin, but also of, of the ideals and uh, ideology which motivated him and uh, how, how inspiring his message is and uh, how, how important it is to bring that message to hear to others. It, as I'm listening, I just remember I was a rabbinical student when he first came to, to power and so much of our a perception of him was formed by the negativity that came out of the American media and so much of the way in which the American Jewish community reacted to him was as a result of that. And I think it's very important for us now to uh, be sure that, that uh, his story is told. So thank you both for, for that. Please remember that on uh, January 13 will be our next seminar. Um, and that'll be uh, with uh, Natan Sharansky with some fascinating stories about Menachem Begin's involvement in the Soviet Jewry movement, as well as in his own plight. Um, and then we will have other ones coming up as well. I mentioned to Paul, there were so many fascinating questions in the uh, chat. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to come back and uh, revisit some of those. Uh, please don't forget also, we hope some of you will give some serious consideration to joining us in Jerusalem on in May uh, for the Menachem Begin Symposium, which will be held in conjunction with the premiere on May 13th of the movie called Upheaval, about a documentary about his life, which is being produced by the Hidden Light Institute, as well as the mission, which will be uh, leaving for Israel on May 2nd, and we'll have a chance to see some of the places that were especially important during his life. So with that, we say to everyone, um, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, we hope that we'll have other opportunities to learn, to study, and to be together. Take care.